does not always work this well. If it always worked this well, you would never see my fat ass again. Well, one today is Thursday, October 5th, 2023. This is the week and charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I'll have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. And today we're going to focus on surviving, surviving and prospering during bad times. And then I also want to do a quick performance-based metrics update. As I have to say, my technical analysis really in that technical, I just look at net net price movements and occasionally a moving average and Landry light and bow ties and things like that. But for the most part, virtually no indicators, again, other than the occasional moving average and things that help to tell me how the performance is going, like the percent from the 50 week closing high, which I'll show you in just one second. I am still working on this YouTube live. It worked great in testing, but uh, it's kind of like trading. The map is not the territory. He worked great in testing, but uh, for two weeks now, we can't seem to get it to work, but we'll keep working on that. Oh, by the way, a little housekeeping, no show next week. I've got a, a lot of stuff going on. I'm not gonna be able to uh, put a show out. Anyway, uh, my YouTube is at Dave Lander. If you want to sign up for these shows live, as they are now, we can ask questions live. Go to davelander.com slash webinar. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's do a quick performance-based update. This is the zone charts that I developed after Jeff, who's here tonight, pointed out that the 5% line is a place where you might want to think about getting out. So, and I decided to add these extra zones in here and make them zones for the for the uh, the most part. So you could see that 50 week closing high is here. The indicator for that would be 100% of the 50 week closing high. This is just 50 periods. So and when you make it a weekly chart, it would be right here. But you could see that as the market drops, the 50 week closing high then becomes here and then here and then eventually probably like right here and so on and so forth so it does take this system a while to catch up to the market 50 weeks actually so jeff had pointed out that the signals in five percent are just as good as waiting for ten percent i did do a little empirical research on that in other words i looked at the charts and and it would be noisier you would get a few more whipsaw situations but he is definitely correct in that it would get you out of the way sooner now anything that gets you out of the way sooner has the potential to have more whipsaw but anyway so once you drop below five percent where we are now things begin to get a little questionable as jeff has pointed out and 10% is a nice round number for the S&P 500 at least and other indices to let you know that we could be in trouble. So right, once again, you are here. Now a sell signal is a close below 10% of the 50 week closing high. So for the math down here it would be 90% of the 50 week closing high. Let a 10% or more drop, however you wanna look at it, is uh, not a good thing. So we're kind of closing in on that. We could get a sell signal fairly soon. I was asked recently, do you think we will get a sell signal? And I don't really predict I follow. Like when I get into position, I have no idea whether, whether I'm gonna lose 10% or make 500%. I'm not, I don't know on something like that. And as I've said a thousand times, years ago it was like for 14 years, I believe, total i advised the hedge fund on market direction and as soon as i would say well i think the trend is up he would say okay well how far is it going to go because he was trading options and then i would say i don't know i'm just a trend follower and then he would say well do you think it could get to this level i'm like well i guess and then he's like well how long is it going to take to get to that level so being an options trader, he needed to know the magnitude. He needed to know how long it would take to get there. So he timing, magnitude, and all these other variables. And sometimes you even have to know volatility. So 
it gets a little tricky in a case like that. But as a trend follower, you just follow along. Now, one thing that I do find interesting is the cues, and I did buy into the system just for S and Gs to follow the system, quote unquote, follow it. I don't know if I'll be able to follow a mechanical system. I like having a mechanical system to help get me out of trouble and warn me of trouble. And when we get a 10% sell signal in this, with the piece, it gives me kind of a line in the sand to worry about. Now, the, the system, the designers intended the system was to get you out of the way before, as Ian McActivy would call it, the diaper change mode. And that's when the market comes unglued. Well, as I've said before, with any type of performance based metric, be it a moving average or a zone chart like this, the 10% line, once you cross below that, once the momentum shifts, once you get Landry light to the downside, once you get a bow tie proper order to the downside, that's when bad things tend to happen. And that's borrowing a line from Baleo and Guyard, who talked about the 200-day moving averages below the 200-day moving average as where bad things happen. But surprisingly, and thank goodness, so far, the cues are kind of hanging in there. I really don't want to give up all the way down to here. So it's going to be really hard for me to continue to hold on. Now, I didn't put money management into this system because I just wanted kind of a nice, pure system, something where there, where you could look at and say whether you should be long or short, and it could add in and maybe build the case for other things. And it was kind of cool because this was developed long before the pandemic. And during the pandemic, we got this weekly sell signal right before the market really tanked. And I thought that was really interested in in hindsight and not in hindsight but in the in the back testing which is in hindsight obviously but going back about 100 years this stupid little system would have gotten you out of the market before every major bear market and no guarantees right i'll give you money back because it's free <laughs> but uh it would also have gotten you out like in 1987 right before the crash so still in this position, I would only make about four points and I was up, uh, what's this, 80 up here. I was up uh, about 60 points at one point and now I'm up about 40 points. So that's going to be a little hard to hold on to. Maybe I'll bail on half. We'll just, we'll see. Uh, I, I'm going to try to see how long I can survive this. And I was thinking this doesn't really give you a a good lesson in following a system if I don't follow the system, but I'm not. I'm not a mechanical trader, so that's I use, I'm a discretionary trader, and watching 60 points evaporate, it's going to be really hard for me, even though I only did 100 shares. But 100 shares is, is better than poking on, okay? All right, let's talk about surviving and prospering during bad times. So this was the portfolio at the market peak, and then I'm going to update it to now on these open positions at least. So we had all these positions open at the peak of the market on July 27. Now, we didn't know it was going to be the peak of the market at that time. And every time I look back and look at the, the peak of the market, I'm reminded years ago, back when there was Prodigy, I don't know if I've told the story before, but there was a guy pumping this medical pump maker and uh, I became friendly with him. And I thought because he posted a lot, he was smart. <laughs> so I follow along and I bought a whole bunch of this stock and I was pretty much just a kid then. I really didn't have a whole lot of money to be spending on stocks. And uh, every time the stock would dip, he would come in and post about how great the company is. It's a minor setback and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, long story endless, one day the stock just got creamed. And I called him up with a little bit of WTF in the mind, uh, in mind because we had become friendly. And we talk on the phone every now and then. And uh, he goes, David, no one rings a bell when the stock market is topped. So I hear that voice. It haunts me to this day. And whenever we top out, I think, David. Anyway, so seeing riots to the protective stop, the trailing stop, it drew down 573. So we made right about a grand on that second loaf on that. So as far as equity drawdown, that was $573 since the peak, obviously. And BTBT stopped out. That was another $509. If you guys remember or go back and look at the service archives, davelander.com slash archives, 
And you can see the newer ones on YouTube now, my YouTube channel, which is at Dave Landry. Anyway, you can go in and look and see how we were very bullish, we being me, myself, and I, I guess. <laughs> we were very bullish on the crypto at the time because the crypto stocks were really blowing and going. And then we got stopped out, knock on wood, thankfully for a profit. But we did have some open profit drawdowns, and that comes with the territory. And believe me, it sucks, but it's all part of trend following. And trading for the most part is learning how to accept things. And you have to accept that you're going to have to give up open losses, I'm sorry, open profits as part of the process. And you might have open losses grow down to where your stop is, obviously, but you can't bust your plan, even though busting your plan often works and makes you feel like you should do that. So the VRM ended up failing miserably. So we were down. 1066 here and then we drew down another $890 before finally stopped out on that one it spelled with silent sh happens or i don't care about monetization shit happens you know <laughs> we're all traders here <laughs> now it looked pretty abysmal up until we got to lfmd and i did a little mark to market earlier on this so this was probably around noon that i put the slide together and on Ellen LFMD, we hit the initial profit target and we're trailing a stop on the, on the remainder. So that actually improved by $2,160. And that was, again, that position was on at the peak. And if somebody magically told you, maybe that guy, you know, David, the market has peaked or I'm going to ring the bell. Hey, where's my shame bell? So, <laughs> one of you guys gave me this a while back. It's uh, it's kind of dusty. It's, it, not that I haven't needed it lately. So when I when I make a bad trade, when I do something stupid, I, I have the shame bell. Game. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that out now that I found it. Mike P gave me that. So thank you, Mike, if you're watching tonight. Anyway, so by sticking with the system, that one went up 2160 and counting, hopefully, somehow it's defied gravity. I don't know how, I don't care. I'm a trend follower, right? And then KNF hit the initial profit target for that, that was $1,000 on the hypothetical portfolio, though I do take these trades, FYI. And for a total profit of 2065, hopefully, I know you should never use that word trading, but hopefully, and counting. So let's add all that up. It looked pretty ugly for a while, but it did get a little better by 2172 total by sticking with positions. And again, I hate to use that word hope, but hopefully the end counting continues with the KNF and the LFMD, which we're still long. Now on 724.23, and you can go and look at all these archives if you want, if you can't sleep at night. And again, if you go to add Dave Landry, you can see the newer ones on YouTube. We had this stock that set up. The entry was here, but look what happened. It imploded. So no trigger, no trade. So that's a big on that one. On 727, we had now the 724, by the way, carried through to 727. So I recommended it on 724. I think it was a weekend. In between so it was actually 4 7 27 but that's the date all the dates i show here are the dates that i recommend the setup so on the 27th which was the peak of the market i recommended mrkr which was a pretty darn good looking setup i'm saying so myself entry was here the stock just rolls over looking pretty ugly how's that for an oxymoron from a trend following moron so another big on that one on 801 wolf WLF entry was here. Stock just absolutely imploded, losing about 75% of its value, but it never triggered. No trigger, no trade. <laughs> As I've said a thousand times, uh, I'd be willing to bet six months from now, this thing's going to be 20 cents. And somebody's going to email me and ask me what to do with it. I'm like, I, I, I think it looks like a turd. It's going down for six months. 
It's like, yeah, well, you recommended it. I was like, well, it didn't trigger. So another on that one. So on the seventh, I O N Q was a buy, and the entry was here. And then after a few days, it began to sell off fairly hard without triggering. I decided to go ahead and pass, probably because it pulled back to this fairly close to this prior little level here. I just didn't like it. It looked like it lost momentum and was in the process of rolling over. And that was probably on one of these red bars here where I decided to just pass. Now it did have a nice little pop, but then it came right back in. But I ended up passing on that one after having it on for a few days. A lot of times I'll talk about jockeying for position and hopefully that makes sense. But basically if I find a setup like this that I really like and I show it in service and each day I update it, whether or not, if it does a trigger, right? And so sometimes after a few days, I'll change my mind. In a case like this, it had given up too much of its recent gains. It gave up the, this whole run from here to here by pulling back a little bit. And I think this is a log chart. I think it was a, if it was arithmetic charts, it would look uh, a little bit more impressive as far as, as how, how big that rollover was. By the way, I use arithmetic charts. I guess if I get really, really long term, some of my charting packages default to longer term, like weekly or monthly, to logarithmic. And that's fine, but for most of the time, or for all intents and purposes, I think arithmetic is just fine. In case inquired, we minds want to know. So uh, uh, August 9th, no setups. August 10th, no setups. August 11th, no setups. August 14th, no setups. August 15th, no setups. Why am I paying this guy to tell me to do nothing? Well. In hindsight, that saved you a lot of money. You saw all those turds that fortunately didn't trigger. Well, there were a hell of a lot more stocks that got torpedoed since the peak of the market. And then the market really got choppy. There just wasn't anything out there. And you have to learn to listen to that database, even though you might want some money or need some money, you just have to follow along. If there's nothing to do, there's nothing to do. And as I've preached, many 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 times i wish somebody 20 something years ago would have told me that a big part of trading is sitting on your hands it's trading being an active verb i felt like i had to be in and out in and out every day like the rat going for cocaine and i'm a little too active here and there on the 21st nothing these are these are potential position trades right i don't want to take a position in the market unless i really really like the setup so 24th we finally get a setup after weeks and weeks and weeks. So here it is, KBH. It's a short. Now, as I was saying in my stock charts show, when you have the 10 simple greater than 20 exponential and the 20 exponential greater than the 30 exponential, that's uptrend proper order. And that's illustrated below. And you can see we had like 50 days of that. So this KBH was in a decent trend. But always make sure you look at the chart. Now, moving average type of system, system so to speak, is going to have a lot of lag. So make sure you always look at the chart, no matter what indicator you're using, and see that, well, hang on a second. The, this is good, still good, because the moving average is still in proper, uptrend proper order. But notice that it's lost momentum. It's gone sideways for quite a while. And then it begins to break down. And the moving averages are a little slow to catch up, but they did catch up fairly quickly, as you can see down here. And once this thing begins to crack a little bit, anybody that bought from, let's say, 52 or 51 or higher is now losing money in this setup. So you can see a first thrust down, also a bow tie. And notice that the bow ties went from uptrend proper order to downtrend proper order 10 less than 20 and 20 less than 30 fairly quickly given the appearance of a bow tie and that's right there now once that happens you want to look for at least a one bar pullback and ideally a deeper pullback but the shallow pullback sometimes can really pay off and i was pretty excited this first day of the trigger thinking that this thing is just absolutely going to implode and the reason you don't want to wait for a deeper pullback is because the whole world 
is waiting for a deeper pullback. So with these transitional setups, like a bow tie or a first thrust or whatever other ones you're trading, sometimes you just have to close your eyes and sell short or buy after the first little one bar, little tiny pullback. Now, as a generic pullback, you'll notice I like a nice, fat, deep pullback for the most part. Unless we get in a rip-roaring bull market where the market just keeps making these bull flags over and over again. And by the way, we hadn't been in that kind of market in a long time, so you don't have to worry about that. Then I might start looking for shallower pullbacks for these established trends. But keep in mind that a trend transitional pattern, you're looking to capture a new trend as early as possible, okay? And so you want to get in as early as possible so that everybody trapped in the market kind of has that old shit moment, <laughs> so to speak. And then they look to dump at some point in time. And sometimes most people don't sell when a stock is on the way up. They sell it on the way back down. They wait for it to rally. If that rally never comes, then eventually they throw in the towel. So a lot of psychology behind technical analysis, at least the way I see it. And, and I, if I can't wrap my head around a pattern from a psychological standpoint, then I toss it out. So there's the entry. Stop was up here. Initial profit target was down there. By the way, uh, just wasn't enough time to put it all together tonight. So maybe in the next show, which will be week after next, I'll talk a little bit about using discretion. But uh, this stock, I think, was down a little bit more today. So it's getting pretty close at an IPT. Don't split hairs. Be willing to take profits a little bit early, like on the ELF, which I'll show you in a few minutes. I actually took profits on the first day, partial profits, because it's just such a beautiful move so far and so fast. Plus the short side, the retrace rallies, if you've ever shorted before, are absolutely brutal. In fact, notice that we had this big old fat retrace rally here. And we were a hurt and pop for about a week in this trade, maybe even longer, maybe two or three weeks. So there was, there's the entry, it's 48. The IPT is 43. We're getting fairly close to that now. In fact, don't split hairs. If, on any week, just tomorrow, I'm probably going to lock in half of my shares, just FYI, tomorrow being Friday the 6th. My apologies to you people who are, um, I see people in the YouTube room waiting on me. My apologies for uh, not figuring out this. Um, Simulcast. I might have to make a new webinar, a new week of charts webinar. The only problem with doing that is everybody's going to lose a link from prior webinars. So I have to work it all out. Anyway, one thing I did want to point out with this, as I said in my Trading Simplified show, is we were underwater in this position for a long, long time. Obviously, anything above the entry is a losing trade. But the reason I want to show you that this thing sucked initially is that you just have to follow your plan. And I have a lot of clients that are like, they're just amazed at how I do this. And let me tell you this, point blank. If I didn't have this plan that I was publishing and showing other people, I probably would have bailed out on this. I probably would have said F this and gotten out. But I've learned over the years to follow the plan that I'm putting out and my life gets a lot easier. So this part of my trading, I have, I'm not gonna say figured out, but I have a working process in place and it makes a lot of sense from a conceptual standpoint. And other trading that I do, not so much, okay? So I don't wanna act like I'm perfect in all this stuff. So, so far so good. Ote but we implied as far as KBH goes. All right, on the 25th, there was nothing. 28th, nothing. 29, nothing. 30, nothing. 31st, nothing. First, nothing. Fifth, nothing. <laughs> Sixth, nothing. Seventh, nothing. Tenth, nothing. Eleventh, nothing. And then on the 12th, we finally get a setup. Nope, nothing. 13, nothing. 14, nothing. 15, nothing. 16, or 18 actually, because it was weekend. Nothing. 19, MNSO was an honorable mention it did not trigger and if you go in and watch the video for it'll probably be the 920 video which is on youtube by now it will the service publishes the night before so that on 919 i mentioned this one as 
an honorable mention. So you need to watch the 920 service if you wanted to see this. Entry was here. And again, I said, let's not take this trade. But it was the best looking setup that was out there that I found. And then so far, you can see it just kind of rolled over. So even if you decided that you were going to take it, there would be no entry. And by now, it's lost so much steam and so much momentum, it's no longer a viable setup. So on the 20th, there was nothing once again. 21st, nothing. 22nd, nothing. 25th, nothing. 26th, ALF. Sell short. So you can see this was in a longer term uptrend. If you take a look at the bow tie proper order, it was good for a long, long time, 60 something bars where the moving averages were in uptrend proper order. Again, 10 simple greater than 20 and 30 exponential, 20, 10 greater 20 greater 30, obviously. As usual, draw your lines on the chart. Notice that 140, it hit a wall. It couldn't seem to get past 140. And then it began to roll over. And notice that it went from uptrend proper order to downtrend proper order after an all time high. So, again, as I've said ad nauseum, I get emails all the time. And, and now that I'm becoming more and more active on Twitter or X, I'm finding that a lot of people who are trading the bow ties are trading them wrong because they're not trading them off of all time highs or major lows now it's okay to use the proper order to help keep in the right side of the trend in the middle of a trend or in the middle of a trading range or whatever if, if a new trend begins to develop but if you're going to actually trade the pattern with a setup make sure you're coming off ideally an all-time high for shorts like this particular stock and it's kind of like the bigger they are the harder they fall and also on the shorting side on the short side it's kind of just the opposite of the long side you're actually looking for more efficient stocks versus inefficient stocks like that lfmd which is i don't know how much it's up so far maybe 50 percent or i don't know if it's up 100 percent or not but uh it's up substantially and that's one that is inefficient because that move was not priced in and it's a little bit thinner this stock here is a little bit thicker it's more well known and when it begins to crack there's going to be a lot of institutions dumping it and a lot of individual traders dumping it. So a little bit different way to go approach the short side than the long side. You want some kind of uh, exciting IPO or biotech. And every now and then, even a coal company on the long side could trade in a very inefficient manner. But on the short side, these somewhat more efficient stocks, these thicker uh, big cap stocks tend to crack really hard. It can make for wonderful shorts. But anyway, there's your bow tie. You can see there's no yellow in between. By the way, yellow just means that some of the moving averages are crossing back and forth. They're not in uptrend proper order or downtrend proper order. But in this case, they flipped over in one day from uptrend to downtrend. And those are my absolute favorite bow ties when they make that cross really, really quick. And again, it comes off of all time highs. So we had a little bit of a pullback here. Here's the setup. Uh, notice that not a whole lot of shares for 100k because we have a 13 point risk now that seems like a lot but 13 points really isn't that far for this stock this stock could move quite a bit so entry was here stop is just right there that's 13 points okay but obviously we adjust down the share size accordingly so it was only 150 shares so this thing imploded on the first day in and i think it dropped a little bit further than this on the first day and i went ahead and I just felt like it was a gift horse. So I went ahead and bailed in half of my shares and I still have half on just in case it continues to implode. I also flipped out half of my options on it because in, in a qualified account, you can't short. So I buy in the money puts and that's another lesson that'll, that'll talk about later on. But the in the money puts were near a double as soon as I put them on almost or, or like an hour after I put them on. So I felt like that was another gift horse situation. And because the, the puts were are expiring tomorrow and they tend to they tend to kind of try to nudge me out of them as quickly as possible. They start calling me and bugging me. So I just the fact that I'm I've got some other things going on tomorrow, I just went ahead and bailed on the rest of them. All right. So the reason I have mystery here is from 10 2 up until today, which is 10 5. 
the it's a live setup so i'm not gonna um at, at a courtesy to my clients i'm not gonna show you what the setup is but you'll find out in a couple days so where are we now well as i said earlier we were better by 2172 and then the elf trade gives us 1392 so we add all that up it comes to 3564 since the market peak on a 100k account so we're about three and a half percent and you can see that the market imploded here from the july 27 peak so peak to trough the market dropped eight percent during that period now the reason i'm showing peak to trough is because your stop is in place intraday and it could get take it out it's not like you wait until the end of the day and see whether or not you got stopped out and then decide to exit. So peak to trough is a very important number to watch when you're looking at what the market did versus what you did. Now I need to check to make sure that that, that those numbers might look a little better. I, I think I have KBH in there. If if I don't, then those numbers will look a little bit better. But even still at three and a half percent, it's looking pretty good. Now one thing I want to talk about is something that I see quite often in this friend slash client forever texted me yesterday or day before and I just asked him if I could use his text and I let him know that I'm not picking on him because I've seen this same reoccurring thing with a lot of other people and let me just show you the text first he says no f an account to short and by the way, this this guy can trade. Okay, this guy is a really good scalper. When the when conditions set up just right, he could he could go in and scalp, and it's a pretty amazing thing. But he didn't have his he he closed down some accounts for various reasons, and he still has bigger accounts. But he but the the smaller, more active trading accounts where he shorts, he ended up closing those down. And so if you're if you're going to be a trader, make sure you have the ability to short or at least buy puts. Now, you're not going to get rich doing either one of those things, but you might make a little money, as I just shown, if you're super selective. And I don't want to get too philosophical because the two shorts worked, knock on wood, so far. But if you're super selective, you might be able to make a little bit of money on the short side. And as I preach, the reason you want to short is obviously because that's the only way to make money when the market goes down, right? But the, the main reason is if you learn how to short, you'll learn how to see both sides of the market and you'll begin to say, aha, this thing seems to be topping. And very early on, I was fortunate enough to work with some very good traders and one in particular, I was just blown away by his ability to be like super bullish and all of a sudden things would tank and all of a sudden he started getting bearish. And fortunately, over the years, I began to learn how to how to do the same thing by listening to the database, by not jumping at it every setup when all of a sudden the market gets choppy, it starts going sideways and letting things unfold and be willing to say day after day after day, no, we're not going to do, we're not going to take any new setups. And believe me, that that drives people away. It's like, um, you know, the the educational business, the the analysis business. When you tell people not to do anything, they they go off and they they go off to chase rainbows. And and before the summer, as I've said a thousand times, there was there was someone that basically told me he was going to go off and try somebody else. And I'm like, because I've been telling him to do nothing for for weeks, and uh, maybe even longer. And then I said, look, the next guy's gonna look like a genius. And we had that fantastic run over the summer. Anyway, no effort account to short and I sold LFMD with everything else that tanked. I was losing my ass a month ago, mother father. So he violated the plan with the LFMD. He's not the only one, okay? And so I'm not picking on him. And that's why I asked for his permission. So I didn't think I was picking on him. And, uh, you can see there's my text below. I was wondering about him, wondering what he was up to. And I asked him if it was okay to share. And he says, as long as you say I've done very well on your investment. So he has an amazing ability. And sometimes it's, sometimes it's, 
I'd say as good or sometimes better than me as far as following the plan that I lay out. And it's it's a very impressive type of thing. And he uses a little bit of discretion past the stops. And not he doesn't throw caution to the wind. He he will get out of things when they're really beginning to implode past the stop, obviously, but he does use a little discretion and he has been able to ride out some amazing trends over the years. As long as you say I've done well on your investments, but lately life got in the way, and instead of staying the course behind the scenes out of the way, I complicated matters. There was no reason to get out of the way and not follow the process just because life got in the way. Amen. So one thing I've been talking about a lot lately is extraneous influences, and you have to separate those extraneous influences from your trading. And I had some shit go down not that long ago. And I'm like, I had to constantly remind you, my, remind myself, it's like, Dave, look, this is this is messing with your head and has nothing to do with trading. So I know he's um, he's wheeling and dealing. He's an entrepreneur. He's a doctor. So he's got a lot going on. He's always moving money around and stuff with uh, with his investment, buying and selling properties, et cetera. But so obviously, I don't know what's going on with him because we hadn't been in touch lately, but there's something going on in his life, and it's probably this house that he's working to set uh, in the process of flipping or whatever, that that's taken all his, his uh, mental energy away. So you really have to be on your toes, and you really have to learn how to separate the extraneous from the trade. And, and without going into a diatribe on all this, if that's the right word, uh, the best thing you do is just document, document, documents. Document your trades, but document your life. And as I preach, wake up every day and write 300 pages. I've told hundreds of people to do this, thousands, I guess, if you count everybody I tell in these webinars on YouTube and all. And very few people end up doing it. It's, it's hard. It, it, it the first, the first three or four weeks of doing this, you're gonna absolutely hate it. And you can struggle to get one page out, but eventually you'll get better and better and better at it. And, and I know I'm a nerd, but I actually can't wait to wake up and start writing, get all this crap out of my head. And then after about a page and a half, next thing you know, I start coming up with ideas and things I want to look at and markets that I want to pay attention to on things of that nature. Okay. What would put me into my biggest state of regret? So where I'm going with this is trading isn't much like life, but like life, it is. it does boil down to making decisions and living with them. And it's really easy to make a decision. It's really hard to live with it. So if you see the market topping out and you decide i'm going to bail on everything i'm going to bust my plan i'm going to bail on everything well make damn sure that you're really willing to live with that decision and say you know what all this stuff might come back but i don't like what i'm seeing here so i'm getting out i think the best thing to do obviously is follow the plan it worked swimmingly this time it does not always work this well. If it always worked this well, you would never see my fat ass again. That I can guarantee. <laughs> but as I'm putting the slides together, last minute I thought about this. Just ask yourself, what would put me into my biggest state of regret? So when he goes to sell LF, LFMD, and again, I'm kind of shocked because he's normally really good at following the service plan and kind of like me he gets in trouble elsewhere you know and i was kind of shocked that he actually sold it because he's so good at holding on to these things and sometimes like i said he'll call me six months later just the opposite of what i said earlier about people buying things that don't trigger but he'll call me six months later in position he's like i'm about three or four percent in this thing you recommended and he just he saw it kind of pull back a little bit and then find support or whatever then take off again he doesn't throw caution to the wind with these things and he doesn't tend to micromanage them. He tends to follow the plan. He gets the system. And, you know, we've had long discussions. He's and he's like, you know, you you suck sometimes, <laughs> you know, because he knows it. You know, it's like he knows that I suck sometimes and that 
conditions get bad and just shit happens and you just have to bide your time because sooner or later you're going to get to these trends and and again it doesn't always work this way you don't know, ride the trend up and then ride the trend down like we just did and have a couple of these leftover winners actually do okay but again i think this is probably the one takeaway for tonight a big takeaway for tonight would be before you make any decision trading wise think about what would put you into your biggest states of regret okay so play it out in your head okay i'm gonna get out lfmd because the market looks crappy and if this thing takes off without me would would you be put into a state of regret so again, just ask yourself, what would put you in a state of regret? And the other thing too is think about life. And you know, I get a little philosophical because you know, trading spills over to your life, and life spills over to your trading. But I've taken that state of regret thinking, and I've put it into my life. It's kind of like, okay, if I did A, would that put me into a state of regret, or what would? What would keep me out or put me in the least state of regret? And trading is a lot like that. You really need to pay attention to, to what you're doing and the consequences of what you're doing. So a couple of market tanking takeaways. Again, see each position to its fruition. The methodology needs outliers to survive and prosper. The occasional 100, 200, 300, 400, and not that often, but every now and then 500% gain can really make your year. And as a trend follower, it's not just my methodology because my methodology is trend following. My only twist on it is one, I'm super selective. And well, it's two. Two, I have a hybrid money management approach where I'm trading for both short-term and longer-term gains, pocketing a short-term gain like on ELF and LFMD, and then hanging on to it for, I hate to use the word hope again, but hopefully a longer term gain. So outliers are key. Now, you never know what position will turn into that elusive outlier. LFMD, I think that was my ongoing dead money report because that stock triggered and died and we were underwater in that stock forever, but it never stopped out. The old me, before I had a public persona and trading service and put out a plan daily, the old me would have busted that plan due to lack of activity. The new me, even though it hurts, I'm like, oh, shit, I'm still on the water in this stupid thing. But hey, what's your plan, Dave? Follow your plan. Now, if you quit early, even with, with good justification, you'll potentially miss out on the outliers. And that's kind of like another thing in life too. It's sort of like, okay, if I do this thing, it might cost me a, a small amount of money, but it could save me in the long run, okay? So if I don't do this, how could it hurt? And I'm trying to think of a good example but none none are coming to my mind right away. But maybe it's like um, maybe fill up your gas tank. <laughs> you know, your gas tank is getting kind of low. You know, fill up your gas tank so you don't run out of gas. Might be one. That's not the best one. I drive so little, I fill up like literally once a quarter. <laughs> so electric car would probably work for me. Don't go anywhere. And when I go somewhere, it's usually far away. So I fly. So again, if you quit early, you have the potential to wipe out an outlier and that kind of that has the potential to negate the whole system. So one stupid little trade that you micromanage yourself out or get out of early for whatever reason, that might be that one trade that makes your year. And I know this is hard. And I actually use the word elusive in here for out, you know, for the that outlier that I was told before by a peer who invited me to give a speech that I make it sound too elusive. Well, sometimes it can be okay because you never know when that outlier is going to come along less is more okay if anything comes out of tonight notice how day after day after day after day after day after day there were no new setups why the database wouldn't produce anything the market itself was choppy the sectors were choppy okay 
And then everything started rolling over. So then we slowly began to put on some shorts. Now, you'll notice if you've been with me for a long time, the old me, the old uh, more active trader me, as far as the position trades are, would have piled on that short side a little bit more heavily. The newer me is a little bit more skeptical of the short side, and I pick my stops, pick my spots very, very, very carefully. Not that I won't still lose money. It's like you know, it's almost like every time a short works, you're like, "Wow, that's cool. It that actually worked," you know, <laughs> because they go against you so much. And shorting again, I don't want to make shorting look easy because it's not. It, it's a real pain in the ass. And you know, sitting through that KBH and watching that thing go up day after day after day, and just looking at this big fat equity loss. It was hard, okay? I'm not going to lie to you. It was it was flat out hard, but then finally following the plan eventually paid off. It won't always pay off. Again, it's another one of those, if if it always worked, you never see my fat ass again. So again, less is more. I went weeks without recommending new setups. And fortunately, the well-chosen ones that I did recommend worked nicely. And again, I'm knocking on wood. Oh, man. I need some new jokes. <laughs> I need to get out. I need to get out because I, it's like all my, I'm, I'm out of stories. <laughs> Wait for entries. God, I, I'm, I can't tell you how. Well, I guess I could tell you. I'm always amazed at at how much trouble can be avoided just by waiting for an entry. And I have to admit, we probably got a little lucky with all this. But I did follow the system, and the system said, okay, pick pick a good setup, pick something you really like, something that's kind of F yeah, and then wait for an entry. And fortunately, stock after stock after stock after stock imploded. And if we'd have taken every one of those trades, what was it, like a half a dozen? I mean, that's going to be at least, what would that be? I can't even add it up in my head. $20,000 worth of losses? Or maybe uh, maybe half that, maybe 10000 or so. By simple well, of, of losses were avoided. I know it's hard to prove a negative, but not doing anything on all those days, I saw a debacle du jour after debacle du jour. And recently, for instance, the energies, the energies, the sector looked great. I just wasn't seeing any setups, okay? And then now the energy is starting to tank, and I'm starting to see some energies tank. Now I'm not turning bearish on energies just yet because they're still in an uptrend. But if I, and, and if I see a setup I really like, I'm going to take it. But it's like, aha, so the fact that I couldn't find any setups, even though the market was in an uptrend, that was kind of the database speaking to me. So again, wait for entries. And then make sure you have the ability to short. And, and I know this guy thinks I'm picking on him, and I'm not. But I've seen people throughout the years who've been at this forever, and they don't... They don't short and they don't put them in this position to be able to short. And you know, if you're not going to short, that's fine. But if but you can't have the regret of not having an account ready to go on the short side, or again, at the least, be able to buy puts. Now, tread lightly on the short side, as I just said, I believe. And of course, as always, short side or long side, be selective. And make sure whatever you're getting to, you think is the mother of all tops and has the potential to really, really implode and lose at least half of its value. All right. Any questions or thoughts? Okay. If you add a requirement to be below the 50 SMA, it helps with the whipsaws. Now we are below that now. Uh, well, Jeff, okay. So, the, the oh the 50 EMA, not an SMA. Ah, okay, I'll look at that. The the reason I use the SMA in that TFM 10% system was I I was actually building lag into the system. Okay, I didn't want to chase my own tail, and that the system keeps you out of the market. I think about 30% of the time, if memory serves. But it will keep you in for years and years and years. And I didn't want a hyperactive system. I wanted something that would, would catch longer term trends. And more importantly, designer's intent. Always have the designer's intent in mind when you trade somebody's system. The designer's intent was to avoid those diaper change moments to get you out of trouble. 
S&P is still above the bottom of its trend channel, but a down close this week could change that. Let's get a comment from Jeff. Yeah, we'll take a look at that in one second. I'm going to go ahead and shift gears, and we'll take a look at we'll take a look at crypto. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here. I don't think there's much to do in crypto. Here's Bitcoin. Bitcoin has some nice Landry light above the 30 EMA. I put out a tweet. I think it was yesterday. What did it call tweets now? X's? I don't know. Uh, it pointed out that Bitcoin has been outperforming stocks. So if you go to stock charts, you can put in a symbol and then a colon and then a symbol. And it's going to give you one versus the other. So I put in Bitcoin first and the S&P second. And over the last couple of weeks, Bitcoin obviously doing much better than the S&P 500. And this is kind of what I hoped would happen in crypto is that we have one go one way while the other goes the other. It's kind of a, a place to look for setups. Let's take a look at Ethereum real quick. So Bitcoin looks okay. I don't think I would rush out and buy it. I mean, technically, you've got bar one, bar two. Technically, you'd be long with something like the 30 EMA thing. One thing I was looking at, though, is, is even though this was a two-bar account, I don't really like these inside bars that are inside this big wide-range bar. So maybe the entry would have been a little bit more here. But mechanically, yeah, the 30 EMA, 230 EMA system would have gotten you long above this high here. But I, I wouldn't rush out and take a signal like that. You've got a lot of overhead resistance over here, so or supply. Everyone look at it. Let's take a look at Ethereum real quick. Um, in general, Bitcoin has been outperforming Ethereum, and you can see Ethereum has imploded fairly hard as of late. So that's that's kind of looking ugly once again. And as I often say, the the easiest thing to do or to learn if you're brand new to trading is don't buy anything that is below the 30 EMA and that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. Let's just take a look at some of these crypto pairs by strength. See that looks pretty good. KNC, you've had a nice thrust higher followed by a pullback 30 EMA. That actually looks pretty good to my surprise. That looks pretty good. But you can see a lot of ugliness here. And again, what I just say, don't buy anything if it's below the 30 EMA. This thing imploded forever. And these are, I have them sorted by strongest pairs. Let's see if anything else pops up. So what was that, KNC? That looked pretty good. So I'm not seeing anything else on the fly here. As I've said, a nauseam, sometimes when the market is really, when crypto is really blowing and going, all you do is just buy the strongest ones in here. Right now, we're not in that kind of blown and going market. But uh, to my surprise, there was one that looked okay. That KNC looked pretty good. All right, any crypto questions? We'll go ahead and shift gears and we'll get into stocks. I'm just gonna do a quick market update and then we'll start uh, punching in your individual stocks if you wanna look at some. Uh, eventually, I know once we get to the, the, the live YouTube, we'll get more and more stock picks. But it seems like once I started the Facebook group, the stock picks dried up because we talk about stocks all day. S&P 500 inside day today, not a whole lot to read or glean there. I wouldn't get too excited one way or the other. One thing I was telling my premium clients tonight, my paid clients, is that the service clients, that is, that I'm a little disappointed that we hadn't had a really big bounce from oversold just yet. That's a little concerning. Let's take a look at the dollar real quick. Dollar's been strong. Dollar is the uh, dog with least fleas. I know stocks would probably go up if the dollar was a little weaker. But boy, I tell you, given the state of the world and everything going on, I'm not confusing the issue with facts, but I would get really nervous if the dollar really started to tank. I think we'd have a lot more problems. So I hate to use the word hope again, but let's hope that doesn't happen. Right now, a nice uptrend. What's not in an uptrend is bonds. It doesn't take a rocket surgeon to see that. Look at the Landry light. We had one little intersection of the 30 EMA. And for the most part, this thing just absolutely has been imploding for a long, long, long time. Let's take a look at it. Well, let me just show you something real quick. One thing that's 
I talked about a couple of weeks ago in my Livermore series is that Livermore talked about watching the previous leaders and when they break and they don't come all the way back, you need to be concerned and Apple would certainly qualify as one of those leaders. And I I didn't know that Livermore had actually said that. It's something that I've been watching over the years and, and in reminiscence, he says there's nothing new under the sun, which is actually, I think, from Ecclesiastes. So that's saying itself from 140 years ago from Livermore was not new. NASDAQ Composite, lots of Landry light below that 30 EMA. You can see it was really good, huh? Back here, good, right? And then just flip it back and forth, choppy. And then now it looks like we're kind of rolling over into that downtrend. The P's and the NASDAQ both have these head and shoulder looking tops to them for those keeping score. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty is just ugly, ugly, ugly. Short term, immediate term, it's just imploding. Longer term, it's just stuck at the stupid sideways range as it has been forever. Energies, unfortunately, and, and I guess fortunately, we weren't getting a lot of setups in here. And I kept telling everybody, let's wait for a pullback. We've got this shallow pullback, still no setups, right? And then a little bit of a rally and it begins to implode. And I actually saw a few energies rolling over. So we might, and I'm not in a big hurry to go do it just yet, but we might end up shorting the energies. The good news is uranium, and I did get long the CTF today, FYI, for day trade, and I kept a few shares on. But uh, I recommended this last night as a possible trade in the service to get some exposure to uranium. And knock on wood, so far so good on that. So uranium in the energies, if you want to count that as an energy, is doing pretty good, better than the actual energy. So this is a little disappointment. This is kind of like the last of the Mohicans here when energies began to tank. So that's a little scary. Even though the market recovered today, some areas continue to implode. That's foods. This is just ugly, ugly, ugly. Banks have been in a pretty serious rollover, but they're kind of all over the place. A little bit of a bounce today. Real estate, as you would expect, with bonds as ugly as they are. By the way, you know, you know, <laughs> don't believe everything you read. It's like you see these posts out there that talk uh, that talk about how rates are higher, but home prices are lower. So you're better off now than you were when rates are lower. Well, I would just encourage you to do the math on that. If you're a realtor and you're and you're posting those memes, do the math, okay? And you might want to pull them down so you don't look like you're putting out misinformation. And I know you're just trying to cheer people up, like, hey, the prices have come way down, so it might be time to buy. But the math does not work maybe in like a really cheap house, okay, but not anywhere near the median price of a house in the United States. But I digress. Uh, drugs, as I've said quite a bit, have given up 100% of their breakouts, so that's a bummer. Nice little bounce today, but let's look at kissing each other just yet. And, you know, like biotech, this is the bounce, kind of bounce I'd like to see from an oversold situation. Biotech looking pretty ugly in here. We probably could see some shorts setting up. There, so I'm not a huge fan of shorting biotech because these stocks can be wild and crazy. I'd much rather short a cosmetic company, a home builder, or something kind of boring, just the opposite again of what we do and everything else. Health services, pretty serious downtrend. I mean, the list goes on and on. Defense has been absolutely creamed as of late. Manufacturing's ugly. MNC, the home builders I've been talking about a lot. Leisure. So go through these at your leisure. And you'll see as transports, lots and lots of areas looking ugly in here. Software's looking toppy, kind of a head and shoulders top. It really hadn't broken down as far as the head and shoulders top is concerned. But for all intents and purposes, it's it's not a pretty chart and looks really super toppy in here. Semiconductors have pulled back a little bit, but so far top remains in place there too. So without boring you to death, I know too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's looking pretty ugly out there. Utilities have imploded as of late, thanks to bonds, probably. All right, any individual stocks you guys want to talk about? Okay, SPY is still about the bottom of a trend channel. SPY, bottom of a trend channel, maybe longer term. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not see. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so so Jeff is saying that I guess on a weekly basis we're still sort of in a trend channel. And yeah, it doesn't look completely ugly on those zone charts that we were looking at earlier, but it's starting to look questionable. 
and as I've been kind of joking lately, it's like I wouldn't rush out and sell the forum, but you might want to have it appraised. All right, any individual stocks you guys want to talk about? I know we talk about stocks all day, but weekly. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And that's kind of where we are. That's kind of something to think about is on a weekly standpoint, we're still sort of okay with all this. And that's why I'm trying to hold on to that Q position because if you go back and look at what we talked about earlier, if you rewind it later, you'll see that the Qs really haven't come unglued just yet. Yeah, it sucks. I gave up a lot of those open profits. And again, I can't promise you that I'm going to continue to follow it mechanically. And now I wish I'd have put some money managing in, management in there. If you're up 60 points, take off half. <laughs> All right, going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I thank everybody for attending. Again, my apologies to you folks that are that are waiting on YouTube for me to show up. I, I, I'm going to work to get this ironed out and figured out. And uh, it's going to probably be a little weeping and gnashing of the teeth uh, before we finally get it all done. But uh, it'll happen. Anyway, everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then. I'll see you in two weeks. I'll see everybody else tomorrow. Everybody's here tonight, at least, in Facebook, in my group. And then everybody else, and well, everybody in general, may the trend be with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you.